Thank you to these companies and organizations that make the Before I Die New Mexico Festival possible. A good goodbye, Gail Rubin, puts the fun in funeral planning. Compassion and choices, improving care, expanding options, and empowering everyone to chart their end of life journey. Daniel's Family Funerals and Cremations, Fairview Memorial Park, Gabaldon Mortuary, Sandia Memory Gardens, and Vista Verde Memorial Park, all in the Albuquerque area. Estate Pros, offering professional dispersal of personal possessions due to a move, illness, or death. The Final Exit Network, educating about and defending the right to choose at end of life. French Funerals and Cremations and Sunset Memorial Park in Albuquerque. Gathering Us, providing in-person and virtual memorial services and online memorial pages. Keeper, providing hybrid and virtual memorial services and keeping memories alive with online tributes to preserve, celebrate, and share life legacies. Morris Hall, estate planning attorneys in New Mexico and Arizona. Remembering a Life, your guide to honoring a life well-lived from planning a tribute to mourning a loved one. And Retirement Extender, investment management services with a personalized strategy recommendation based on your needs and objectives. And I am honored to have with us to speak to us today about the unspoken symptoms of grief, Todd Van Beck. Todd is a funeral educator, consultant, and historian, and he is much in demand for speeches about this and other topics, including history. He has an encyclopedic knowledge, and he is the Dean of the College of Funeral Management at the University of Memphis, was an educator at the Cincinnati College of Mortuary Science, um, Hudson Valley College, New England Institute, and Commonwealth Institute, and he is an inspiring speaker, and I am so honored to have him joining us for the Before I Die Festival this year. Please welcome Todd Van Beck. I have to admit to you, after 52 years uh, in this line of work, I've concluded that experts do not exist. Concerned people exist, dedicated people exist, but my career has been pretty much once I thought I had a handle on most everything to do with death, dying, grief, bereavement, mourning, ritual ceremonies, something happened in my career, somebody died some way that defied the textbooks, it defied the experts, it defied the lectures. So I come to you with great humility uh, and I appreciate Gail's invitation. Uh, I crossed the Gale's path in uh, Atlanta in July. Uh, we bonded and uh, here's the consequences. So <clears throat> with that said, any deficiencies that you find in my work, and there are many, many people that find great deficiencies. The minute they hear I'm an undertaker, immediately uh, they are suspect of anything that comes out of my mouth. So if I disappoint you, you have only Gale to level blame at, right? Because she uh, is the one who graciously extended the invitation. Um, so I went to Ireland to do a series of seminars for the Irish funeral directors. I was there for a month. I uh, took an overnight flight out of Atlanta to Dublin. Maybe some of you have had this happen to you. I've had it happen regularly for half a century. Um, <clears throat> uh, usually I uh, sit uh, by uh, people uh, on the flights. This is about an eight hour uh, one way flight over there. And I usually use it as a nap time. Uh, but this night or this evening, this uh, young lady sat next to me. She was very charming, 
Um, and uh, so she leaned over to me and did this usual standard Delta airline chatter, right? Uh, Hi, my name's uh, Tiffany. What's your name? My name's Todd. Oh, where are you going? And I thought that was somewhat of an innocuous question because it's a one-way flight going to Dublin from Atlanta. So obviously we're going to the same place, but that was just my private cynical side. And uh, I said, well, I'm going to Dublin. She said, well, so am I. Oh my, what a coincidence, right? Uh, and so dead, dead, dead silence, see, dead silence. Um, and then she leaned over and she goes, I'm in technology management, right? I didn't have a clue what that meant, right? I said, oh, that's nice, that's nice. Dead silence. And then she leaned over and asked the million dollar question, which I get asked always for 52 years. What do you do for a living? And I looked at her and I said, I could have said, I could have said, I'm an undertaker, I'm a funeral director, I'm a mortician, I'm an embalmer, I'm creepy. I could have said that. And it would have been the same reaction. I said, I'm a funeral director. And bam, that was the end of the conversation. So when you're 38,000 feet in the air, there's nowhere to go. The plane was packed. So eventually, she began to cross the threshold of death anxiety to death interest. Because when you're sitting next to the undertaker, which is the absolute symbol, a living symbol of death, you, you can't get any more realistic than sitting next to the person who cares for the dead. And she looked at me and she said this, are you really a funeral director? And again, my cynical side, I thought to myself, why would anybody claim to be that if they were not such? Why would, of all the careers I could have picked uh, to uh, bamboozle her, I could have picked anything, but I told her the truth. And she leaned over to me. Um, and finally, she said, I, that's, isn't that a depressing job? I said, well, no, not really. And so here's what ensued. For eight hours, and I bet most of you on this call have experienced this, regardless of your title or regardless of how many letters we have behind our names in academia, right? I bet you all have experienced this. Once they find out that you have some connection to this interesting, fascinating, stressful subject of death, dying, bereavement, grief, mourning, dead bodies, etc. Once they cross the threshold, I sat there for eight hours and I listened to every loss experience this young lady had. And she had a lot of them. And I knew how to listen to her. I did a bunch of minimal encouragers for eight hours. I'm, oh, hmm. Yeah, oh my, hmm, really? Oh, hmm, hmm, hmm. Well, what do you do? Well, I'm, for eight hours, I'm just over there grunting and moaning at her uh, with minimal encouragers. When we go to the customs in Dublin, her husband's waiting for her and she comes and she looks at me. Now I have to say, I don't know if you good folks have done this. I have found myself many, many times in my professional career doing the last bloody thing I want to do, such as spend time getting through customs, right? The last thing on my agenda is to, is to spend a lot of time waiting for the Irish custom agent to scrutinize whether I'm legal or not. So she said, I want you to meet my husband. I wanted to go take a nap. And I said, all right, yes, 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 of course. So I go in there. And so here, here is her husband. I don't know if you remember the male model Fabio, right? This guy was like this male model. He had a big mullet, like Samson's hair, right? And trim and tall and 
right? Uh, exact opposite of me, right? And, uh, and she said, this is my friend Todd. Now she's calling me Todd, right? And she goes, and he's one of the smartest men I've ever met in my life. Now, I'm not smart by any stretch of the imagination, but I knew how to connect with her to listen to her story about the myriad of losses in her life. Now, I tell you that not to establish any type of groundwork that what I'm about to go into is going to have any merit or any meaning because there's some spe there's sometimes audiences uh, most of you, I imagine, are speakers in front of audiences. You never know what motivates somebody to attend one of these things. Some are genuinely sincere. Others are there to ambush you. Uh, others are there to debate you, uh, et cetera. Uh, so I, 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 I tell you that to ground this in the simple connections of human beings to human beings. And that sounds unbelievably simple, doesn't it, right? But I've been on the receiving end of the death experience a lot for a long, long time, where people, the death rate's 100%, is it not? You got a belly button, you're in somebody's womb, enough time goes by, you're in the tomb, right? That's an arguable fact. But yet when I introduce myself as an undertaker, people go, oh my God, he's a crook. Oh my God, he's a creep. He's gonna rip us off. You gotta watch those undertakers, right? And look, you, you, none of us on this call can be naive that that doesn't occur, right? And I'm particularly aware of that. So the question is, where does that come from, right? And I'm, I wanna lead into this unwritten symptom of grief but I'll get into that in just a minute because I've got a link between what I'm talking to you about and this un un unspoken symptom of grief. Um, I wrote an article on this subject for the British Funeral Directors Magazine um, and it seemed to go over fairly well. Uh, much of the stuff I write flopped, uh, but this particular one uh, seemed uh, to have some uh, success to it. Uh, so. What, what is this? What is, what is the uh, causal agent that people uh, are interested, many people, about talking about death, grief, bereavement, and mourning, but when it comes to personal death awareness of their own demise in life, that's an entirely different dialogue. It's easy, is it not, or easier, to talk about somebody else's loss, somebody else's death, than it is to talk about my own demise. Now, I'm at an age where I can say to you very truthfully, I have a lot more years behind me than I've got in front of me, all right? Uh, I don't know of anybody that's lived to be 140 years old, right? Which you do the math means I'm 70, Right, so do I have 15, 20 more years left, right? So what do we do with that? Now, some of you are well familiar with the writings of a man named John Bowlby, B-O-W-L-B-Y. He wrote uh, several books uh, about this idea of attachment and separation. I am quite a disciple of Bowlby's because I have found in my own career that grief is almost always predicated on the depth of the attachment. And that sounds so nice and so accurate and so cool. And so, yes, that's true. Uh, but the side that I'm interested in now, as I see how society is approaching death, um, well, I'll give you an example of how society is approaching death. We have more books and more seminars such as what we're participating in on the subject of death, dying, grief, bereavement, and mourning than I can ever recall in my career. And yet, 
the incidences that I run into of death denial, of death anxiety, of death phobias continue to grow. And I'll give you an example of this. The college here that we have, which is training up and coming funeral directors and embalmers, we have a uh, agreement with the Veterans Hospital here in Nashville that if an indigent veteran dies, uh, we go, the students go make the uh, transfer. Uh, they do the preparation work, uh, the dressing, the students do the funerals and we bury the indigent veteran free of charge at the Veterans National Cemetery uh, outside of Nashville. So when I first came here some several years ago, we got a death call at the VA hospital and I said, we, the school was very busy, right? It must've been enrollment time. I said, I'll go, I'll go make the transfer. I'll go, I'll go get the body. And one of the staff members looked and said, and I don't mean this to be cynical, but I'm trying to make a point. She said, well, you don't know where the morgue entrance is at. I stood there for a minute and I said, I don't need to know where the morgue entrance is. All I've got to do is find the garbage dumpsters and I have found the entrance to the morgue. When you have a society that the morgue entrances at hospitals are next to the garbage dumpsters, that is an unwritten, unspoken symptom of death anxieties, of death denial, of death phobias. Let's push it to the side as far as we possibly can. Now, I'm not here to challenge the hospital administration. <laughs> Who am I to, to do that? But it leads me to this idea of grumpy, fussy, cranky, touchy symptoms of grief that sets people off. Now, I'm not talking heavy clinical stuff here. I'm not talking about complicated grief. Uh, I'm not talking about mass grief or uh, exaggerated grief or any of the types and models of grief. I'm talking about a simple um, um, symptom, grumpy, cranky, fussy. Let me ask you this. Do you know anybody in your family or in your social circles who are unbelievably grumpy at times, touchy, fussy, cranky, right? Now, the answer has to be yes, right? And the question is, are you born that way? Where does that come from? Here's another question. Where does it come from that undertakers are creepy? Where, where did that start out at? That we're crooks, that we're here to sell you God knows what for whatever purposes. And, and there's always a better way to care for the dead, right? All right where, does, where does that come from? Well, I, I have an answer for it. And it goes to the heart of this, of this work. And then we'll open this up for some questions. I want to make sure uh, my time is being respectful. Um, it comes from Charles Dickens, all right? If you read Oliver Twist, Oliver Twist gets apprenticed to an undertaker in London. Now, before I tell you some of this, we got to remember that Edgar Jackson, who was my psychology professor when I was in mortuary school in Boston, in fact, Edgar Jackson in 1957 wrote a book called Understanding Grief. He predated Elizabeth Kubler-Ross by 10 years. All right, now Edgar Jackson's book was better than Kubler-Ross's in my opinion, but the timing wasn't right. The culture hadn't gone through the sexual revolution yet in 1957. And if you can't deal with sex, you're gonna have a devil of a time dealing with death. All right. And we'll come back to sex and death in a little bit. But in that book, he said, when people have inordinate anxieties about death, they oftentimes show dislike, enmity, and ridicule and criticism of uh, people that deal with the dead. 
Now that's all, that's been the case, not just now, but that's been the case all through history, right? But Charles Dickens took this to another level, right? So if you, let's go back to Oliver Twist. So Oliver Twist gets apprenticed to the local undertaker. And the local undertaker in Oliver Twist's book, the name of the undertaker is Mr. Sourberry. Okay, now you all are familiar with the literature approach that the name of the person says it all, all right? So here you've got this sour berry and, and he's this creepy undertaker that's wringing his hands. He's got a tape measure hanging out of his pocket, et cetera, okay? Then you move on to another Dickens novel and The Undertaker. Now put your seat belts on for this one. Is named Mordecai Mold. Yeah, oh my God, right? Mordecai Mold. All right, now any of us that have any knowledge of human decomposition know exactly uh, what Dickens was talking about there. So he set the stage, other people have picked up the mantle, right? And to be sure, there are some folks that would probably fit that profile, I guess. I've, I guess somebody could accuse me of doing that. I had a lady the other day, I was standing in line at Kroger's and she looked at me and she goes, what do you do for a living? She goes, don't let me guess. She said, you're either a judge or you're a lawyer or you're an undertaker. <laughs> And I said, does it show, does it show that much, right? Okay, so you have to have a sense of humor about it. So let's talk about this, um, where I, and I was in line at Kroger's the other day too. And here's this man, older man, older than I am, which is always comforting when I meet people older than I am, right? Because it's the message is if they can do it, so can I, right? Man, he was going after this uh, clerk, this checkout lady, honest to God, man, he was taking her up one side and down the other. She, she, her chin was quivering. She was almost in tears and he grabbed his bag and he marched out of there. And I thought to myself, was he born that way? I did. I watched him. He's just a miserable old human being unhappy. And look, I had an Aunt Tilly. I had an Aunt Tilly who was exactly like that. She was my dad's oldest sister, right? My dad, if he was alive today, would be 96. And Tilly was 20 years old when dad was born, right? And Tilly was this grumpy, cranky, fussy old lady. And I, I'm telling you, she'd come to family gatherings. I don't know if you ever had relatives like that. She'd come to family gatherings and my mother would come over to me and she'd go, go over and give Aunt Tilly some sugar on her jaw. That's an Iowa farm thing about going over and kissing them on the jaw. And I remember as a kid, I'd protest. No, 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 don't make me go there. Don't make me do it. Because Tilly, honest to God, uh, she had a wig that didn't fit. She couldn't put her lipstick on to save her soul. Right. I mean, she kind of looked like me. Right. I mean, we had a family resemblance. Right. Put a wig on me. You got Tilly. I go over there and I'd go to kiss her and I, I, I didn't have a clue what to say to her. Not a clue. My mind is blank. So I say something stupid like it's a nice day out, Tilly. And she'd look at me and she'd go, yeah, but it'll be cloudy tomorrow, kid. All right. Now freeze that frame on Aunt Tilly. So Charles Dickens had this thing about people that step up to the plate to actually care for dead people, right? And if you know his history, if you know what happened to him, as if you knew what happened to Jessica Mitford, right? Who was an eloquent spokesperson about how weird we were and thieving highwaymen, pirates, et cetera, right? Even though, even though the funeral home in my hometown in Iowa 
opened up in 1899. The same family still owns the funeral home. So could it be possible that they were just a bunch of thieving crooks for over a hundred years? Is the public, of course not, right? It's, it's absurd. They were trusted, respected members of the community, right? But Dickens takes this, right? And he uses Mr. Sourberry and Mordecai Mold as these prototypes of expressing his own anxieties about death. And Dickens had anxieties about death. Death was not a peaceful subject for him. And then he took it to a new level of psychology that I wanna share with you. He wrote a book about a young man who had a series of significant losses in his life. And the book, you've all read it, you've seen it on TV, was called A Christmas Carol. So when The Christmas Carol opens up, uh, Ebenezer Scrooge, the name now is, right, is an adjective for being a miser, right? Uh, it's a personal pronoun that is now become an adjective in its own right. Um, if you remember the story, this is kind of interesting. I hope I am not abusing your time by reminding you of this. But Dickens ends, uh, the story opens up with him, uh, die, uh, old man, a, a miser. But then he gets visited by these ghosts. And uh, of course, it's, it's pure fiction, uh, to be sure. But the message is unmistakable. Scrooge is a grumpy, cranky, fussy, 1840 Aunt Tilly in London, right? Scrooge was alive and well in Avoca, Iowa in the 1950s as he was in the 1840s in London, England. How does that happen? And I'll go back to Tilly in just a little bit because this is a silent symptom of grief is this concept of being grumpy, of being unhappy with life and not seeing your way any way beyond being unhappy and grumpy and cranky. And we don't talk about that much in seminars, right? We talk about the clinical aspects of it, but maybe nothing so blightingly simple. <clears throat> so you see Scrooge, when Scrooge opens up, when Dickens starts to tell us about Scrooge, it's he's in an orph he's in a boy's home. And he's in a boy's home because his mother died giving him birth. And the father blamed the child. Now, that is a psychology that I personally have seen in my own career, where family members start to shoot arrows at innocent victims that have had nothing to do with the trauma that the adults have, and usually the victim's a child, right? And so uh, Dickens uh, has uh, uh, the only person that Scrooge can show affection to is his sister. His sister comes and gets him out of uh, the uh, boy's home. And then on top of this, uh, the sister marries. Scrooge disapproves of the marriage just like his father did. And the sister dies, giving birth to Scrooge's nephew, Fred. And guess who Scrooge blames? He does the same bloody thing to Fred that his father did to him. A generational dysfunctional family. And every one of us is very familiar with that psychology. And it, it happens constantly, constantly, right? If Scrooge won't talk uh, to his nephew. He freezes him out. Then on top of that, Scrooge falls in love. And by this time, Scrooge has become this narcissistic, covetous, grasping old sinner to quote Dickens, and he loses the love of his life. So now you have three major losses in Scrooge's life. 
and the only thing that he's got is money. So in these ghosts, remember the story, right? The ghost of Christmas past and old Fezziwig and the ghost of Christmas present, the old fat guy, uh, kind of the Santa Claus type. And then the last ghost. And the last ghost, in my opinion, is the key to the psychology of personal death awareness, of how do we grow from our losses? And sometimes uh, fear is part of that growth, right? Where the epiphany scares the bejesus out of us of how we've been living. And we're gonna go back to Tilly in just a minute now. So the third ghost, if you remember, this is a powerful literary motif, isn't it? The character doesn't have to say anything. There is no dialogue for the third ghost. The third ghost, in fact, it reminds me of a little verse that you've probably heard. It said, I walked a mile with pleasure and she chatted all the way and not one thing did I learn from her for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow and not one word said she, but oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. At the end of the story, what turns Scrooge from a grumpy, covetous, selfish old man to a person who embraces life is when the third ghost points to the open grave and looks up and points to a tombstone. Now, let me give you death anxieties. I gave this motif, I gave this story at a seminar one time and this lady in the front row, here she is, she puts up, she goes, here it is, I see if you can uh, come to the same conclusion I have. I just went through this whole thing about grumpiness. How do people end up that way? Usually it is from unresolved losses in their life, right? I have concluded that the root is unresolved losses. And that can take any kind of avenue it wants to, right? Because as Ernest Hemingway said, every human being's life is a novel, right? So as I listen to a lady for eight hours on a Delta flight, right? Uh, every one of us on this call could tell our own uh, series of losses. And when people look at me and say, oh, I haven't had any losses in my life. And I go, well, how old are you? And they go 40. I don't believe them, right? I don't, I don't believe them. How can that possibly be? Of course it can't be, right? They're just playing, they're playing games uh, with the speaker, right? And so uh, Dickens, right? Uh, this lady at this seminar, we were in Toronto and I didn't get a feeling she liked me from the get go, right? You can usually pick that stuff up, right? When you're given a talk. Um, and so I, uh, I, I said, he, the ghost pointed to the open grave and he pointed to Scrooge's monument with Scrooge's name on it, the birth date, and there was a death date on it, right? The alpha and the omega, the womb to the tomb, the beginning and the end. The Christian writer says, we have not here a lasting city. Well, what are they talking about? They're talking about a hundred percent death rate, not grief counseling right? Us, me, right? Um, so she puts her hand up and here's what she said. She goes, I don't want a grave. I'm going to be cremated. Oh, okay. All right. A lot of people get cremated. Okay. And then she goes, and I don't want a monument. I don't want any kind of stone. Uh, Cause I'd asked, what do they want on their headstone? Which is kind of an antiquated question, I guess. And that set her off. And finally, I looked at her and I, I said, so you don't want a grave, you don't want, you're gonna be cremated. Do, what do you want on your urn? I don't want an urn. Okay, okay. So I, you know, I'm going down the list of a legal disposition, right? Uh, and so finally I said, well, how do you want us to type your name on your death certificate? All right, so why would she do that? in a seminar where we're talking about Charles Dickens, right? It's death anxieties, right? Now let's go back to Aunt Tilly. I was in college at BU in Boston 
when Aunt Tilly died. I get a call. My grandmother was a registered nurse. She had been a nurse in France in the First World War. Uh, my grandmother graduated from nursing school in 1909, and the course was 90 days long, and she walked out as a registered nurse, right? So I fly out from Boston out to Omaha, and I go out to the funeral home where Aunt Tilly's, lay. and there Aunt Tilly is, you know, she's laid out in the box as, you know, is this the custom of our little Iowa town, right? Cremation was unheard of back then in our little Iowa town, right? So I went over, I sat next to my grandmother and I was a college student. I was feeling my oats. I was going to Boston to school uh, from Iowa, kind of like a, wearing an epaulette. I made some wisecrack about Tilly, all right? All right, something came out of my mouth, something stupid. And, and the minute I said it, I could feel my grandmother's laser sharp radar on me, right? When my mother, when my grandmother got upset, it was like the third ice age is moving in on you, right? Cold, cold universe she creates. And I couldn't take it, see, because I knew she was staring at me. I looked over and I go, what, what, right? <laughs> so stupid, huh? She goes, you don't know what you're talking about, so you hush up. That was her favorite line. You hush up. That's just Iowa farm stuff, see? And uh, I said, but grandma, she was, she was so grumpy. And my grandmother said she had good reason to be grumpy. Okay, so this goes back to Hemingway about every person's life's a novel. I said, well, wh wh what, what happened to her? My grandmother said, well, she was engaged to be married to a man named Alfred Barnholt, whose family owned a farm south of town. And he was drafted into the First World War. He was killed. They never found his body. She did not ever get married. And Tilly, here it is, never got over it. So for the first time in my life, I walked over to the casket and I looked at Tilly laying there. And for the first time in my life, I felt a sense of deep sympathy for her. And then I felt how futile it was to keep family secrets. Because if we had known, if any of us had known, uh, our family was not good at, uh, we were not good at feeling sharing. But if we had known what Tilly had gone through, is it possible? that she would have not ended up a grumpy, cranky old lady? Is it possible that she would have ended up with some peace and contentment in her life, which she did not have until the day that she died? I think Charles Dickens was more of a thanatologist than what we give him credit for, particularly when it comes to the story of how grief overload unresolved grief overload in life can take a toll and not not some massive clinical toll where you're out robbing a bank because of mass grief or you or you self-destruct over no just the grumpy guy at Kroger's grocery store line just that just that incidence I've got one other thing I want to share with you and then we'll open this up for questions, because um, I think my times, I want to be respectful of all the other speakers. Um, it has struck me that it's uh, very difficult to do what all of us do in the year 2021. I have been in this for over half a century, and I can tell you, it is a hell of a lot more difficult to be an undertaker in 2021 than it was in 1968. Part of the reason is because the society has gone through these massive, massive changes, right? And one of the most significant changes that I've seen that seems to be an 800-pound gorilla in the world of death, dying, grief, and bereavement 
is the subject of combining sex and death. Those are two immensely cultural universal subjects, psychological universal subjects, theological universal subjects, sex and death. Every one of us on this call have, we owe our lives to the issue of somebody did it somewhere, sometime, someplace, right? And I know I find that incomprehensible to imagine my parents, but they obviously did that. I don't mean to be crude, but I'm, I'm probably not going to cross any of your paths ever again, so I'll take the risk, right? But here I am in 1950, right? My mother and dad got together, and nine months later, boom, here I am. Happened about five billion times, you know, all over the place, all over the place, right? So let's go back to 1921, 100 years ago. Where do people die? They die, and I'm not talking about let's go back to the good old days at all. I don't think the good old days were all that good, right? But they died at home. They were embalmed at home. The embalming was done in the residence, usually in the bedroom where the decedent had died. The casket was taken to the home. The body was casketed in the home and the casket with the body and it was laid out in the living room for three days, right? And in my town, even when I was growing up, dead bodies were laid out for three days. And the reason was not because the undertakers wanted to do it, right? It's because the Dutch reform clergy person in our little Dutch community said Jesus was in the tomb for three days. Now, whether you agree with that or not is irrelevant to what I'm telling you, because in 1957, that was relevant, right? We listened to what the Dutch reformed clergyman said, even if now looking back, he didn't have a clue what he's talking about, right? We listened to him, right? So death was highly visible, highly visible. There was none of this morgue entrances next to garbage dumpsters. There was none of this camouflage laundry hampers taking dead bodies down. You know, people talk about the reality of death all the time in psychology, but when they're confronted with it, the culture is unbelievably creative in making it invisible. The most controversial aspect of our profession is viewing dead bodies. They, it, that, is, that thing has been taken up one side and down the other, even though there's many, many credible investigations, such as the Coconut Grove Fire of 1942, which my professor was part of that, that concluded that people that had unresolved grief had one thing in common. They hadn't seen their dead loved one in, in death. And they had, and you've all talked with parents missing in action uh, from a war. Um, we had it in Vietnam all the time that yes, intellectually, I guess, yes, okay, the military said this, but emotionally, every night I go to bed, my brain goes into overdrive about the woulda, coulda, shouldas of what's happened. Now, in 1921, if I stood up in a uh, public forum or if I got on a Zoom call in 1921 and told all you good people, how you all and me got here by your parents doing something in whatever year, nine months before you were born. Uh, if I stood up in front a, on a Zoom call, just with you good folk and said the word vagina, uh, penis, uh, erection, egg, sperm, and nine months later, boom, here Todd is. I know my parents did that. I know they did it. My grandparents did it for my father, right? I bet yours did too. <laughs> what would have happened to me in 1921 if I stood up and talked about what they're teaching in first grade in sex education today? I would have been arrested. I would have been put on a pole and taken up to Kentucky 
get, get him up to Kentucky with the rest of the smut peddlers up there. We're gonna tell children things we don't even believe ourselves about how babies get here. But in 1921, death was everywhere. Funerals from the home, they were three day events, et cetera. So my point is that makes our work more difficult. In 100 years, these two subjects have flip-flopped. These two subjects have undeniably flip-flopped. We can talk about sex and ad nauseum. Talk about death and the lady on the plane shut down the conversation. That lady on the Irish flight was, when I told her I was a funeral director, she ended she was so anxious. She started reading the Delta Sky magazine. Is that pitiful or what? Have you ever read the Delta Sky? I mean, you want to talk about coping desperation. There was nothing in the magazine. She put her headphones on. They didn't work. Surprise, surprise on Delta, right? And all of a sudden, the dialogue begins. And I am going to suggest to you that the dialogue, this conversation is more essential now than it's ever been. Because 50 years ago, we did have three days for the dialogue, right? 50 years ago, whether we liked it or not, we had three days for the dialogue. Now, three hours, right? Can, can a meaningful ritual? Yes, I, yes, it can be created. But that takes creativity. Let's see. I think that is, uh, Gail, I think that's all of my notes that I had that I wanted to share. Thank you, Todd. That was so eye opening. And I also, you know, my motto is talking about sex won't make you pregnant, talking about funerals won't make you dead. And, you know, I've been doing this for 11 years now, so far, so good. So uh, I really appreciate that reference. And there is a very close relationship between those two topics. And, and we are loath to really talking about both of them at, at different levels, I think. But yeah, thank you, that was so eye-opening. Todd, I'd like to ask you about going back to um, Scrooge and, and the ghost of Christmas future showing him the grave. I always thought that was like the scariest part of <laughs> the movie. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. is, is that something, I mean, if we confront our own deaths that, that we can find a way to live more present, joyous, fulfilled lives? I, uh, uh, absolutely. In fact, that is a, an ancient theological concept is called eschatological urgency, right? Rollo May wrote a book called Existence. Now, Rollo May, uh, we don't talk about him much at all anymore, but I, in my opinion, he wrote the single best novel on the, on counseling ever written, uh, one novel called The Art of Counseling. But Rollo May wrote another book called Existence. And on page 49 of that book, he writes this very poignant paragraph about the confrontation with death gives the most positive reality to life itself. Death is the one fact of my life, which is not, uh, it is not relative. It is absolute and concrete. And my awareness of that gives what I do each hour an absolute quality. Right, so we call that the urgency to live life based upon the humble resignation that ever, that, and here's the humble resignation. If ever there's a meaningless idea in life, right? Now, Joel Olstein won't agree with me on any of this stuff, right? Right, let's be happy, let's be carefree. Uh, you, you, you deserve to be a millionaire, right? That, that's, that's, right. If ever there's a meaningless idea in life, it's this way. Tomorrow is another day, right? I have spent my entire career dealing with the reality that that statement is not true, right? There's one way to be born, but there's a million and one ways to die, right? And, and I'm not here to claim any type 
of expertise or authority, but I have seen some good individuals make very weak decisions based upon they're making it up as they're going. They have they they spend more time picking out a barber and a hairdresser than they do thinking about end of life issues. And and Lord above, right? I noticed that the funeral homes in New Mexico were one of your major sponsors, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and with good reason, right? But Lord above, if the undertaker stands up and says, you know, you better go prearrange your funeral. Right, you better get this done, right? Because don't you pay your fire insurance on your house? Oh yes, absolutely. Well, what's the risk of your house burning down? How many of us have had our houses burned down? I haven't. You have one in twelve thousand chances, but you buy you buy the insurance for the risk of the fire, right? Well, what's the risk of dying? A hundred percent. Yeah, the risk of dying <laughs> is a hundred percent. And when and 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 this is this is the anxiety of the subject. Don't you remember? You all know this. When they when they came up with life insurance, it was originally called death insurance, and they couldn't sell the damn stuff. Right? They couldn't sell it, so they turn it to life insurance, which is ditto expo facto death insurance. And boy, everybody, boy, I got a million dollar policy here. So it it it. It does work. The, the, one of the most frequent things I've been asked to do as an undertaker, and I like the term undertaker, right? I like that because I don't like all this pretension of titles and all that, uh, is bury letters with dead people. It, it happens constantly and nobody does it in a public forum. They always pull you aside privately and say, put that in the casket with mom put that in so let me ask this is a very professional organization you have what do you think are in those letters do you think it's oh geez thanks pop for giving me the keys to the car for the senior prom or is it apologies oh, atonement, explanations right all right that's what rollo may is talking about mm -hmm. right and and my personal opinion is no matter how difficult this is much better to get your soul unburdened with a live person than it is a corpse. That is, corpse conversations are one-sided. They're important. And if that's what you've got to work with, then go for it, right? But yes, absolutely. I personally think, I think that's a religious, ancient religious concept about death awareness and getting on with life uh, okay, so I'll give you an example. Tilly was never able to embrace that. Mm. Tilly was saturated with her own and grief in a way, and nobody likes to say this. It's a little, it's narcissism. It, it's a self-absorbed emotion, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Even even people that death becomes a welcome visitor to the sick room, many grieving people will go, oh. I didn't think she died that fast. You know, they they grieve for themselves, right? Which is normal. Uh, but Tilly took it um, and it paralyzed her, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 because we wouldn't talk about it, uh, it paralyzed our ability to be supportive of her. Mm. And so my recollection is just a grumpy old lady. Yeah. Well, I see That's Bob right. Hoffman has raised his hand. Bob, we have to be quick because we're coming up in the end of the hour. Uh, yes, a uh, quick question is, I'm considering a home funeral and I wanted to know what I should or shouldn't expect of my needs from a funeral director. Well, Bob, thank you for that question. I am a great believer in home funerals. I, I, I absolutely, in fact, when I started in my career, half of our funerals, the body went back home. Um, so your question, will some funeral homes be more cooperative with that than others? Of course. It's like some hospitals are more cooperative than others. More, some dentists are more cooperative. You know, we're talking, 
I would find, and in, in the area that you're in, I'm familiar with most of those firms, um, uh, I, I think you have to find the right firm that will accommodate everything that you want, right? They should not say anything no to a home funeral because some of those firms that you put on your sponsorship are so old, they've been there so, so bloody long, they, they know how to do home funerals, right? Yeah, so, Bob yes. is, uh, one of the wonderful things about Zoom, Bob is actually in the Washington DC area. Okay, um, well, uh, there's, a, there's a Gallers and uh, Pumphreys uh, and uh, Silver Springs, uh, they're, they're, those are good solid funeral homes. The other thing on selecting a funeral home, and I'll just say, you need to find out who owns the funeral home, mm -hmm. All right? That's important today because the corporate presence in funeral service is a significant presence now, particularly in metropolitan areas. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank sir. You. Thank you for the question. And we are at the end of our hour with you, Todd. This has been so wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, thank Incredible. you for the invitation, Gail. Thank you.